We are reaching you live through a unique and complex international telecommunication network via satellite, microwave, and cable. The International Training Center at San Diego State University brings us all together in this video conference, which joins distinguished organizations located in Mexico, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina, and the United States of America. We would like to thank SATMEX, PANAMSAT, and BRAZILSAT for their satellite linkage services, which allow us to reach all of you through the wonders of telecommunications. Welcome to our program, the Global Communications Net, the latest on the Internet and the World Wide Web. This is the fifth video conference of the series, Foundations for Prosperity in the Third Millennium. My name is Michael Reel, and I will be your moderator for today's program. I am director of the School of Communication at San Diego State University. Today's video conference is composed of two presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. The convergence of digital electronics and telecommunications has produced a global communications network supported by mega investments in satellites, microwave, and cable systems. This process has been fueled by the recent privatization of government-owned monopolies in more than 50 nations around the world. The Internet and World Wide Web are, of course, important components of this often invisible global infrastructure, which is fast becoming accessible to all types of organizations and sectors of society. There is no question that the Internet is increasingly the foundation for a new industrial order. For example, in the United States today, a full 16% of car buyers shop online before showing up at a dealership. And they're not just comparing car colors, they are gathering information on dealer costs. The ready availability of such information gives the consumer more purchase control. Increased consumer buying power is a trend we are seeing in all business sectors thanks to the Internet. Are you convinced that you really understand the potential impact of the web? Are you sure your organization will not be left out of this new net-centric economic order? Are you sure the people you care about are protected against its excesses? In a recent article published in Fortune magazine, it is proposed that the web will fundamentally change customers' expectations about convenience, speed, comparability, price, and service. The same article points out that, though the Internet still represents a small fraction of total purchases globally, its growth has been incredible. Consider that a short decade ago, this phenomenon, the World Wide Web, did not exist. Today, there are an estimated 161 million Internet users worldwide, and the numbers increase rapidly every day. Latin America has already 4.5 million Internet users. Canada has 7.6 million. Asia and the Pacific, 27 million. Europe, 37 million. And the United States, 83 million. The global communication network, today's emerging mega network, propelled by new information technology, is increasing productivity. It is co contributing to better crime prevention, improved medical care, expanded educational opportunities, new commercial activity, and an increased level of convenience. But, but, it is also generating less and less privacy. A 1997 survey by the American Management Association of 900 large companies found that nearly two-thirds admitted to some form of electronic surveillance of their own employees. Intel and Microsoft have been criticized because their chips and software transmit unique identification numbers 
whenever a PC user is connected to the Internet. Intelligent software systems can now scan and identify individuals from video images. Pocket-sized smart cards will soon be able to store all of a person's medical and credit history, as well as the physical data needed for identity checks. Some experts believe that we will soon see the emergence of information intermediaries, or infomediaries. Firms that broker the information between consumers and companies, giving consumers privacy protection and also earning them revenue for the information they are willing to release about themselves. David Brin, an astrophysicist and science fiction writer, sees privacy so under attack that he proposes a radical alternative to government regulation and security systems to protect privacy. In a speech he gave here last month, and in his book, The Transparent Society, Brin proposes that everyone should have access to all information. Transparency would enable people to know who knows what about them. If everyone has access to all information, it will prevent the powerful and rich, he argues, from deriving privileged benefits from the control of information. What about industrial secrets and government security? Well, there's unlikely to be a single answer to the growing dilemma posed by the conflict between privacy and the increasing access to personal information. Surveillance and counter-surveillance technologies will compete in education, business, and government around the world and will contribute to the continued expansion of our complex global communications net. Although the e-corporation will be the theme of a future ITC video conference, we can now say in general that the explosion in the number of mergers, acquisitions, and joint ventures by and between the major technology companies will also begin to produce a new breed of, C of CEOs, e-CEOs, e-managers, and e-professionals. These e-specialists will further propel quality services, efficiency, and business productivity within the global communications, and they may further threaten personal privacy. AT&T, the telephone giant, for example, recently became the, the biggest cable TV group in the United States by purchasing Media One. This purchase immediately led to a direct alliance with Microsoft so that Media One and AT&T is now positioned to offer competitive broadband internet and interactive services throughout the United States. This is the, the ultimate convergence of technologies with telephone, television, and PCs thriving on the internet backbone. This is our future world. Of course, the telecommunications-based web will not replace offline marketing and retailing, but it is producing a new consumer and citizen, one with a new profile, and consequently a new breed of organization. An organization heavily equipped electronically, combining telecommunications, computers, the web, and massively complex enterprise software. Are we ready for the transformation? Whether we are engaged in education, business, or government, this is the crucial question right now. How can we thrive in this exciting and unsettling world of cyberspace? Will consumers surf through the cyber shops, leaving malls and Main Street empty? Will in-person sa sales forces disappear? Will schools and service agencies and businesses that can't serve the public online become obsolete? Will the global communications network become the only playing field with no political borders or geographic barriers? This motivating video conference will present an overview of this expanding mega network. The distinguished speakers will give us an update on some major projects and trends we must all know about to get ready for this brave new electronic world. 
in particular the state of the art of video streaming will be presented by a leading technology company CEO and reflections will be made by our experts as to the future competitive environment we should expect in coming years. It is a pleasure to introduce to you today's distinguished speakers, Dr. Fred Saba and Dr. Harry Gruber. Dr. Saba is a distinguished faculty member of the Educational Technology Department at San Diego State University, where he teaches courses and carries out research in the areas of design, development, and production of instructional systems using video, interactive multimedia, and integrated telecommunications technologies. He is also founder of Saba and Associates, a group of experienced consultants who specialize in distance education with 25 years of experience in the field. Dr. Saba and his associates have been involved in policy analysis for the establishment of new large-scale distance education systems. Dr. Saba's clients have included major Fortune 500 companies, universities, and government organizations. Dr. Harry E. Gruber is a co-founder of Interview and has served as chairman and chief executive officer of the company since July 1996. Prior to founding Interview, Dr. Gruber founded two startup biotech ventures, Gencia Incorporated and Viagene Incorporated, which completed initial public offerings in 1990 and 1993, respectively. From July 1995 to July 1996, Dr. Gruber served as Chief Scientific Officer of Gencia, and from 1998, 19, excuse me, 88 to 1995, he served as Vice President of Research. Dr. Gruber serves as a Director of the University of California at San Diego Foundation, and a member of the Board of Overseers for the University of Pennsylvania College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Gruber obtained his MD and BA degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. Let's begin with a preliminary question. What are the most exciting developments that you foresee for the Internet and the World Wide Web in the next 12 months? Streaming video and streaming audio are two emerging technologies as new servers and broadband telecommunication technologies will become available. Those are the technologies to watch. Dr. Gruber. I absolutely agree. There's an exponential growth in the audio video content that's being uh, delivered over the Internet today. And this is uh, uh, fueling the deployment of broadband throughout the world. That's a good beginning. Let us now turn to Module 1, in which Dr. Saba will speak to us a bit more about some of the latest developments with the Internet and web technologies and some of their applications. Thank you. During this module, I will discuss recent developments in web technology and the Internet in general, giving examples of some current interesting projects utilizing the web, and then I will conclude with remarks about what we can expect in the future of the World Wide Web and information technology. The most important recent World Wide Web development is an emerging synergy among maturing web technology, the restructuring of business and higher education, and rapid growth in the global economy. It is hard to imagine that the web technology emerged only four or five years ago, yet it has penetrated our organizations and has changed many business and educational practices. The World Wide Web is a multimedia platform with a global presence. Furthermore, databases and emerging authoring languages such as extensible markup language, or XML, have made the web interactive and useful to the professional needs of managers, 
trainers, university faculty, and school teachers. For example, in courses I have developed on the web, I use a database for students to present their project proposals to each other and to keep each other informed on the progress of their course activities. XML is a very promising web technology which has just been released. Using this technology, the web author can mark up different passages in a text with a set of tags, which identify that passage for later search and display. In other words, HTML, or hypertext markup language, which I have discussed in previous ITC programs, is for marking up the look and feel of a web page, while XML will enable the web author to mark up the content of a web page, thus making it possible to pull text passages on different documents together and, in a sense, create a new article. In addition, the web coupled with new course development tools, email and online discussion forums has made collaborative working and learning available to large and small companies as well as universities and colleges. The internet in general and web technology in particular have had a major impact on the restructuring of business, education, and training too. In the world of business, electronic commerce has enabled companies that are only a few months old to compete with industrial giants that have decades of experience. Amazon.com, for example, is a virtual bookseller with only a web-based business and no mortar or brick stores. It did not exist before the web, yet it has seriously challenged major national chains and has compelled them to develop a web presence as well. Stocks of this and other web-based companies such as Yahoo are selling several times their earnings, raising eyebrows of Wall Street observers. Nevertheless, investors are betting on their future and keep buying their overvalued stocks. For example, General Motors is worth $50 billion on the stock market while America Online, the internet directory company, is already worth $120 billion. The way we conduct business has also been profoundly impacted by the increasing presence of the web. A recent example would be the resignation of the chief executive officer of Compaq Computers. Apparently, Compaq, one of the leading manufacturers of computers, was slow to adapt to selling computers on the web. Compaq started to lose its leading market share very rapidly. And this loss, in large part, led to the company CEO's decision to step down. Now, let me say a word about the Y2K problem that we have all heard about. Here are some points that organizations should consider according to the Futurist magazine. How the organization will perform essential tasks in the absence of present systems. How the organization will respond to failures or slowdowns in information and supplies. What simplified systems can be developed now to replace existing ones. How we will work together with suppliers, customers, clients, and our communities and how to develop systems to ensure open and full access to information. As a general example, our university has been dealing with the problem on a decentralized basis. Each college of the university is upgrading its subdivisions systems separately. Hopefully, all will be well as the clock turns to year 2000. Now, back to more on the web. Educational institutions can no longer ignore the web. It is imperative for all institutions involved in teaching and learning to have a major web presence and to provide courses online. With a rapid increase in the demand for education, dwindling public resources, and increased competition for colleges and universities that were 
once considered to occupy safe territories, we are finding that there are no safe markets anymore. Students anywhere in the world can enroll in the web courses offered by institutions hundreds if not thousands of miles away. And last but not least, the acceptance of the market economy by almost all countries of the world, albeit in varying degrees, has led to a global economy with all countries competing in the international arena. The Internet has had a major role on the evolution of this new economic paradigm. Business communication and transactions, which used to take months to complete, can now be handled in a matter of a few seconds. The web has put product information, pricing and availability, if not outright purchasing power at the fingertips of many people, practically revolutionizing many of our traditional business practices. In fact, according to a recent article in Business Week magazine, many officials of the United States Federal Reserve Board agree that the nation is in the throes of a technology-driven productivity boom that is letting the economy grow faster than once thought possible without setting off growth, strangling price, and wage hikes. So who is leading the revolution? Which companies, universities, or government officials have made serious commitments to the concepts presented in this video conference? Well, one interesting example is Dow Jones University. Dow Jones is the parent company of Wall Street Journal, the widely read and highly respected daily newspaper. Dow Jones University, or DJU, draws its faculty from reporters of the Wall Street Journal to teach online courses on personal financial planning. Although current courses taught at DJU are not the mainstream courses of universities and colleges, they signify that institutions of higher education may lose their monopoly on the generation and distribution of knowledge which they have enjoyed for several centuries. Web technology, to a major extent, has been responsible for propelling business firms into the arena of knowledge generation and dissemination. Western Governors University, or WGU, provides us with another example to watch now and in the future. What makes the university innovative approach interesting is that WGU was established by the cooperative efforts of several Western state governors, such as Governor Levitt of State of Utah and ex-Governor Romer of Colorado. The university has no courses of its own, but brings together courses from different universities, colleges, and even businesses and industries within the United States and elsewhere in the world. Furthermore, it is a competency-based university, meaning that graduation and earning a degree does not depend on how many credit hours of coursework you have completed at WGU. If your skills meet the standards expected, you will earn a degree regardless of where the competencies were learned. You may actually have learned these skills in previous courses at other universities, on the job, or on your own. One interesting development that will impact the global communications net is the continued drop in the price of computers. We all know the top-selling brand like Dell, Compaq, and Hewlett-Packard. But now you can add to this list what are called e-machines. They are produced by an Irvine, California-based company, which didn't even exist a year ago. E-machines are now part of the big league computer market thanks to the very competitive prices that they offer on their products. While the average retail price for a computer in the United States was approximately $1,000 in U.S. dollars in 1998, the average price for e-machine computers 
is just over 400 US dollars. This price advantage helped the company sell more than 180,000 units in the first two months of business in 1999. And the momentum continues. E-machines now own roughly 6% of the desktop retail market on par with Apple and its much publicized iMac model. Market research has proven that a $500 computer will not take customers away from the $800 market, which means that the e-machines company is expanding the global communications network. The question still remains, however, whether the company can turn a profit. Well, its executives believe that sales volume is the key. They feel they are on track to reaching a billion dollar in sales during 1999. In the United States, computer spending is already the third most important household expenditure after telephone services and house maintenance. The trend is for internet connectivity companies to team up with the hardware companies like e-machines to further low prices of computers to the point where monthly internet service will be a monthly fee such as is cable television today that will include the computer and peripheral equipment free of charge. So what will the future hold? Although no one can predict the future. Certain trends are emerging. Here I list some of these. First, there will be massive growth in available bandwidth made possible by Internet 2, which I will define in a moment. Second, there will be new collaborative programs among businesses, universities, and community colleges. And third, there will be increased maturation and development of the global economy. Let me further explain the trends. Today, a group of federal agencies, universities, and private companies are developing Internet 2 to handle the ever-increasing traffic on the present Internet. This will enable the global network to handle bandwidth-intensive media formats such as real-time video, conferencing, 3D imaging, CAD CAM, and many other novel uses, including telepresence and telesurgery. Internet 2 was put into operation on February 24, 1999, with a network providing 2.4 gigahertz of bandwidth. This is 45,000 times faster than the 56K modems, which are now the standard in most computers. Two years ago, when planning and development for Internet 2 took a serious turn, only 34 universities and a dozen or so private companies were involved. The most recent media reports indicate that 150 universities and 1,512 businesses and industries are now participating in the project. What's more, a few days ago, the New York State Education and Research Network, NICERNET, announced that it is delivering live Internet 2 traffic between five of New York State's major metropolitan centers. Those are New York City, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo. Thus, Internet 2 is leaving the parameters of research universities and industry development labs and entering into the mainstream of metropolitan and enterprise applications. The most recent addition to the list of Internet 2 supporters is Microsoft, which commands a lot of power in installed software base throughout the world. Microsoft's participation is bound to make a major contribution to further development of this global telecommunication system. Another interesting synergy is a new wave of two-way collaboration between business and industry on one side and universities and community colleges on the other. 
collaboration between the private sector and institutions of higher education is not a new phenomenon. But the reality of the new economic paradigm and the universal availability of the World Wide Web has changed the magnitude and the form of such collaboration. First, the private sector is emerging as a major provider of education and training to major universities and colleges who have thousands of faculty, students, and employees. Many higher education institutions are finding out that it is cheaper and easier to contract major providers of courseware in information technology to train their staff, faculty, and students on using computer software and telecommunication systems. For example, when thousands of newly arrived university students need to learn how to work with a particular email software, which has been standardized for a particular campus, it is less expensive for the university to allow the vendor who has manufactured the email application or a third party company which has developed hands-on training for that particular application to do the training. On the other hand, many community colleges and some universities are developing contractual relations with particular businesses and industries to repurpose existing courses or create new ones. For example, it is easier, less time consuming and less expensive for a college to repurpose an algebra course than for a corporation to build a new course from scratch. The important point about such collaborations is that they are taking place across national boundaries in increasing numbers, thus expanding an already vibrant and energetic global economy. Web technology is certainly not the cause of the rise of the current globalization in the economy and may not be a major player yet. However, information technology